buenos días. Bienvenidos a esta segunda jornada de Digital Enterprise Show. Soy Sandra Infante, directora de este encuentro. Y hoy dedicaremos nuestro Inspiration Theater a hablar sobre todos los retos que la inteligencia artificial nos está brindando. Hoy contamos para inaugurar este gran foro con Héctor Gómez, ministro de Industria, Comercio y Turismo, a quien doy la bienvenida y le pido que suba. Hola, muy, muy buenos días a todas y a todos. En primer lugar, quisiera felicitar a la organización por este extraordinario encuentro donde se dan lugar eh, numerosos conocedores expertos eh, de la inteligencia artificial con más de 260 horas de ponencias, lo que habla muy bien a las claras del extraordinario contenido y la riqueza en cuanto a la información y el conocimiento compartido. Y desde luego, eh, desde el Ministerio de Industria, Comercio y Turismo, respaldamos y apoyamos desde todo el Gobierno el espacio que nos obliga a caminar en una senda de avance y desarrollo en España, en España, en Europa y en el mundo. Hoy es imposible no debatir, no hablar, no analizar. Precisamente en este momento en el Parlamento Europeo se habla, se eh, negocia sobre el formato legislativo europeo en materia de inteligencia artificial y también tenemos la obligación en España de poner a disposición todos los instrumentos posibles para que en el ámbito privado y público podamos seguir avanzando y creciendo. Hablamos de un país, España, que presenta y ofrece las mejores condiciones para el desarrollo empresarial, el desarrollo económico, todas las garantías y la seguridad jurídica, simplemente ya efectos de conocimiento e información de interés. El 2022 fue el segundo mejor año de la serie histórica desde 1993, en el que España tiene información oficial de inversión extranjera en España. Y desde luego en el ámbito de crecimiento económico presentamos unos parámetros excepcionales. Eh, triplicamos la media de crecimiento en el marco de la Unión Europea y eso desde luego es un ecosistema, un espacio ideal para poder avanzar, crecer, invertir y desarrollarnos en este mundo. Desde luego la inteligencia artificial tiene un gran potencial de transformación. En ese proceso de transformación y liderazgo que España está inmersa, Podemos poner como punto de partida en este impulso y liderazgo europeo como consecuencia de la pandemia provocada por la COVID, la primera vez que la Comisión accede a los mercados de capital con una cantidad de 750.000 millones de euros para los países miembros y poder atender los numerosos, numerosos desafíos que provocó la COVID. Y desde, esa, desde ese punto de inflexión, Evidentemente tenemos la obligación no solo de recuperarnos, sino de transformar la sociedad, el conocimiento, el desarrollo económico, tecnológico. Y ese es uno de los grandes retos que tiene España, Europa y el mundo, para no quedarnos rezagados frente a otras grandes superpotencias que avanzan a velocidad destacada. Creo que no es exagerado decir que el modelo económico se replantea a través de la industria. Y la industria tiene una, un espacio de flexibilidad y rápida adaptación a los cambios como es el de la inteligencia artificial. España, entre la industria, el comercio y el turismo, supera el 40% del PIB y eso desde luego nos obliga al ministerio que dirijo a hacer un esfuerzo titánico por adaptarnos a esa realidad. Hablamos de digitalización, hablamos de transformación, de transición ecológica, de la economía y eso desde luego no sería eh, posible sin un esfuerzo también desde el ámbito público, económico, financiero, para que sea una realidad. Tenemos la enorme obligación desde lo público de facilitar al privado, a la iniciativa privada, que esa transformación sea un éxito. Son numerosos los programas que hemos puesto en marcha, eh, tanto en el Ministerio de Economía, Ministerio de Industria, Comercio y Turismo y otros ministerios, para garantizar el correcto desarrollo y evolución de España. También en defensa, quiero destacarlo, tenemos un desafío en materia de ciberseguridad. Eh, el espacio global, el espacio internacional, nos obliga a ser muy cuidadosos, minuciosos y a estar a la vanguardia también en medidas de seguridad, en el cuidado de la información. También me gustaría mencionar eh, los 98,5 millones de euros aprobados recientemente para impulsar en el ámbito del ministerio que dirijo de, a través de, de ENISA, 
los préstamos participativos que harán buena parte de, del esfuerzo en materia de financiación del emprendimiento industrial y que tendrá una componente muy importante en el ámbito que nos ocupa hoy. Hablo del impulso de la investigación científica y el desarrollo tecnológico en inteligencia artificial, también de la potenciación del talento nacional y la atracción del talento global. Creo que, sinceramente, es uno de los aspectos cruciales, trascendentales en materia de inteligencia artificial. El desarrollo de plataformas de datos e infraestructuras tecnológicas, creo que otro de los pilares que, que nos debe ocupar en el ámbito público, y la integración de la inteligencia artificial en las cadenas de valor para transformar el tejido económico que comentaba con anterioridad. Por lo tanto, y a modo de conclusión, sí me gustaría señalar algunas pinceladas. No hay mayor política que la de la responsabilidad en el ámbito de la gestión pública. No hay mayor honor para trabajar por un país y transformarlo con ayuda de todos, si es posible. Ayer participaba en un evento donde hablábamos de todos los ingredientes que se necesita para avanzar por, como país. Y faltaba uno, coincidíamos, lo organizaba la Cámara de Comercio de España y era el del consenso político al que apelo y apela a este gobierno de manera permanente e inconstante porque el consenso, el acuerdo político y la estabilidad ofrece seguridad, seguridad ofrece garantías de éxito, evolución y desarrollo. Y no hay mayor inteligencia que la de formar parte de una revolución tecnológica como la que estamos viviendo y científica, que es una gran oportunidad para la integración y el despliegue de la inteligencia artificial en nuestro país y que sirva para mejorar las aspiraciones también colectivas de la ciudadanía. Y esa inteligencia no es artificial. A modo de conclusión, lanzarles un mensaje de, de optimismo, de apoyo, de ánimo, de orgullo también, que seamos capaces de organizar encuentros de esta magnitud, de orgullo de país, de proyecto de España vertebrador y sobre todo la riqueza tan potente que es el conocimiento que ustedes ponen a disposición de todos y de todas. Por lo tanto, nuestro más absoluto respaldo, apoyo y, desde luego, eh, garantizando la continuidad de un evento tan, tan, tan importante que nos ayuda y nos marca una guía en cuanto a la orientación informativa y de conocimiento. Muchísimas gracias, que tengan una muy buena jornada y a vuestra entera disposición desde el Ministerio de Industria y Comercio y Turismo. Gracias. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Magnus Melander, and I'm from Stockholm. I am the founder of Things, and I work a lot in Deep Tech Alliance. I'm the moderator and host of the AI series today. I'll tell you, this is not the first wave of AI. I experienced my first wave of AI when I joined IBM in 1982. It was the hottest on the planet. So we have seen many waves since then. It's difficult to us, human beings, to understand actually where we are today with AI. But then it's going to be more interesting to see the road ahead, which is moderated by José Luis Cordeiro. Welcome. Okay, uh, good morning. Uh, it's good to begin this session with the full room uh, after uh, listening to the Minister of Industry, Trade and uh, Commerce. We have three incredible uh, panelists with us. Um, actually, we have been just talking before about the implications of artificial intelligence. So let me invite them one by one. In that corner, uh, Ricardo Palma. So please, Ricardo, join us in that corner. And uh, Ricardo is, uh, is a good friend, actually. I have known him for, uh, uh, I think, one decade. He is the Dean of Finance at Universidad San Pablo uh, in Madrid, CEU San Pablo. He is an expert on finance, economics, and also he's interested in new technologies like artificial intelligence, blockchain, uh, virtual reality, and uh, similar things. So he will have a very interesting perspective covering those areas and also uh, covering the education sector as dean of the university. So then we are going to have next to him Edgardo del Rincón. Edgardo del Rincón, who is a Mexican who arrived uh, a few days ago from uh, Ciudad de Mexico. He is the president, the CEO of the eighth largest bank in Mexico. And he has led the digital transformation of his bank, which is Banco Bajio. Uh, the headquarters is in uh, Guanajuato, León, the capital of the León uh, uh, state in Mexico in, and the city of Guanajuato. So he has been doing a fantastic digital transformation of the bank and using many technologies, obviously, associated with artificial intelligence. And then we are going to close our panel with Paulo Magallanes, who arrived from Lisbon, from Portugal. 
So Paulo is, uh, is the vice president of uh, ECB staff for uh, Southern Europe. And that means not just Portugal, but obviously Spain, Italy, and uh, the region of uh, Southern Europe. So we have an incredible panel. So I want to begin with an applause to them, please. Um. OK, and now uh, we are all here together. Uh, I gave a very quick presentation, but I want each one of them to introduce uh, in one minute, more or less. And uh, so let's begin with you, Ricardo. Who are you, what are you doing, and why are you in this panel? Uh, you have your microphone. Thank you, thank you, Jose Luis. Uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, we were talking before about talking in Spanish, and I, as I am a member of uh, Marca España, I had to talk in Spanish, uh, but uh, no problem with any question. And also I know that uh, we have a translation, so if you don't mind, sorry. Eh, gracias, eh, José Luis, por la presentación. Yo creo que hoy vamos a hablar, comentábamos en la mesa que, que teníamos que hablar de varias cosas y creo que hemos encontrado un punto de encuentro interesante. Yo represento al sector de educación, tenemos una empresa, una financiera, tenemos otra compañía y creo que en ese círculo que podemos cerrar, podemos plantear. Eh, si queréis, lo dejamos ahora para las, para las preguntas. Ok, fantastic. Edgardo, tell us, uh, because we are so happy to have people from uh, four different countries, actually. Uh, Spain, Mexico, Portugal, and I was born in Venezuela in South America, so I represent another country, even though I live in Madrid now. But Edgardo, Mexico is the largest Spanish-speaking country in the world. You overtook Spain a long, long time ago. So tell us from Mexico. Sure. Uh, my name is Edgardo El Rincón. I had been in the financial sector in Mexico for almost 38 years. Uh, 34 in, in Banamex, then City Banamex, no? Uh, part of Citigroup. Uh, my, my last position uh, there was the, I was the CEO for the consumer business, uh, for the retail business. And I have almost four years leading uh, Banco del Bajío in an important digital transformation that we will have time to talk about later. Okay, fantastic. And now let's get back closer to Spain, uh, Portugal. So, Paulo, tell us a little bit about you and about EC Vista. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Paulo Magalhães. I'm uh, working in this sector, in the IT, since uh, 25 years. So, um, thank you to DES for inviting us and uh, for this fantastic uh, conference. Um, yeah, I will talk uh, more uh, about uh, how the AI, it's uh, what we are doing with the AI. And in fact, uh, before we was talking about it, uh, at this moment, we just uh, hear AI, 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 AI. This is good. AI is democra uh, the democracy. It's it's uh, uh, it's in the in all all attendees. Uh, so AI it's being a commodity at this moment, but we are using AI since uh, many years. We was talking before that maybe uh, there was an election uh, some years ago that was honored by uh, the AI. So this is the purpose of this um, th um, session. Uh, that, that is an interesting point. Uh, maybe we could have a minister that is an artificial intelligence instead of a human person like we had a few minutes ago. But uh, anyway, besides that joke, uh, no one laughed, but anyway, it was meant as a joke. Uh, let's begin with some of the applications. And uh, Ricardo Palomo, uh, he's uh, dean of a faculty in the university, and he has been uh, going through experiments with artificial intelligence, even chat GPT at the university. So tell us what is allowed, what is not allowed, and how can we use it in education for a, a positive transformation? Uh, gracias, José Luis, thank you. Uh, bueno, ahora mismo creo que el mundo de la educación está viviendo un, un shock eh, con la aplicación de la inteligencia artificial. Nuestros estudiantes lo utilizan y aprenden por necesidad uh, y los profesores más por curiosidad. Eh, sí que se percibe en general una resistencia a, a esa introducción, a ese cambio y nos va a obligar necesariamente a cambiar eh, muchísimos sistemas de evaluación 
y también de aprendizaje. Y desde mi punto de vista, y es mi punto de vista porque hay una controversia muy grande, hace un rato comentábamos como los que somos ya un poco más mayores recordamos aquella polémica sobre si se podía utilizar las calculadoras o no en el colegio. Eh, pues ahora mismo vivimos la controversia de si se debe prohibir, no se debe prohibir o se debe utilizar. Eh, mi opinión personal es que la inteligencia artificial es un nuevo armamento con mayor potencia de fuego y que utilizarlo permite eh, ventajas competitivas importantes para estudiantes que posteriormente van a trabajar en compañías como las vuestras. Es posible que en muy poco tiempo sea más importante contar con un profesional que sabe sacar el máximo partido de esa inteligencia artificial que con un profesional que tiene muchos conocimientos que aprendió en su momento en la etapa universitaria. También es cierto, y lo voy a decir, y esto es igualmente muy controvertido, es muy probable que un 30 o un 40% de los equipos de docentes puedan ser uh, reemplazados o complementados en plazo de 5 o 10 años por la utilización de inteligencia artificial, que va a permitir además una mayor personalización del aprendizaje. Los profesores que se mantengan en todos los ámbitos eh, de la docencia, en el universitario y en otros niveles formativos, necesariamente tendrán que ser aquellos que sean inspiradores, guías e incluso impulsores del uso de tecnologías en el modelo de aprendizaje, y obviamente desaparecerán aquellos que tienen menor aportación de valor o que desarrollan actividades muy mecánicas o cualquier otra cosa que desde luego una máquina pueda hacer mejor. Ok, fantastic overview of uh, AI in education. And now let's move to Mexico because Edgardo, you lead one of the top 10 banks in Mexico. Actually, your bank is probably uh, one of the biggest and a big bank even for Spain if we compare Mexico and Spain. So how have you used uh, the digital transformation and artificial intelligence to transform your bank? Yes, uh, let me give you some background. Banco del Bajío is really a, a, a young bank. It has only 28 years of history. The large banks in Mexico, they have more than 100 years. No, uh, So it's, it's a very young bank. And it's mainly, it was mainly a bank for, for companies. The target market was mainly uh, what we call SMEs, PYMES, no? small and medium companies. And more than, at that moment, in, in 2019, more than 90% of the revenue was coming from a relationship with a company of any size. No? Uh, my goal from the, from the board was uh, to, to have an important evolution of the strategy of the bank and develop also the consumer business, meaning consumer business individuals, but also products for the a smaller part of the pyramid in SMEs, in PYMES, right? So in order to do that, we needed first data, no? So, so we create a new area that is reporting directly to me with a chief uh, data officer that actually is here, uh, Eduardo, and, and a, 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 very, a very important uh, group of people uh, lead, lead, lead by, by Eduardo. And, and we partnered with Stratio. Actually, we have been implementing the, the platform from Stratio with very good results. No? So, so the bank already is, is having better data uh, uh, with the right opportunity and the right consistency and, and, and uh, with the right uh, government of data, right? Uh, the other part that, that we didn't have and it was needed is, is to develop all the risk management tools, no? Uh, so we partnered with FICO, with Fair Isaac, and now all the bookings that we are doing of cars, payroll, loan, personal loans, etc., is done through this technology, uh, actually with very good results. And the asset quality that we are having is is one of the best in the industry. No? So we are, we are growing the consumer business in, in loans more than 45% annually, right? And the other component was uh, the digital banking infrastructure. What we realized in 2019, it was the, the electronic banking that we used to have. It was, need, it was not the right one. The technology that was used, uh, it was an old technology. So we decided 
uh, something that it, it was a strong decision at that moment, uh, to start developing a new electronic banking platform from zero, from scratch. No? What is amazing, when you have the, I have, I, I believe, two success factors. No? Number one, the, the, governance mo the governance model of the bank is very simple, and we take decisions really, really very fast. Almost in the, in the same moment that someone is asking for something, right? So that is important. And, and also, the other success factors is the involvement of all the senior management, including me, with all, with all the agile teams that were developing this, this platform, no? So I was having weekly meetings, and, and, I, and, and I was even reviewing every journey no? that was developed. Uh, what is amazing is that we did that in only one year. So one year later, we were migrating the first individuals to the, to the new platform, and six months later, we start migrating uh, companies. No? So at this moment, 100% of our customers are, all, are, are already in the, in the new digital platform. Uh, let me tell you, in my experience, in a big van uh, with more complexity, that could take three, four, five years. No? So it was really, really fast, and the quality is amazing. No? So let me give you, give you some results. No? What is happening with that digital transformation? The customers of the bank, active customers, are growing 9%. Trans transactions are growing 15%. And amounts transacted are growing 20%. So that means today we are a bank one-fifth larger than the bank we were a year before. Some financial numbers to give you an idea. What was very important for us is to develop this relationship with the customers that depends not only in granting a loan, but also the use of all of the, uh, our services, electronic banking, uh, collections, payments, FX, etc. So non-financial income is really important for a bank. Uh, that source of revenue today is growing 30% year over year. Total revenue of the bank is growing about 50%. And as we have expenses under control, uh, net income is growing 70%. So the efficiency ratio of the bank, that means how many cents uh, you spend in order to generate one dollar of revenue, it was a year, uh, uh, a year ago, it was around 45%. Today is 32%. That is, for me, it's best in class. It's best in class in any geography. No? So very good results, no? more transactions, and the experience, no? the MPS in all the, the, uh, the uh, digital channels and branches is, is really, really be, uh, very good. By the way, the digital users are growing more than 45%, and transactions in digital channels are growing more than 30%. So it, it, it's, it's, an, it's amazing the results you can get having the right transformation in a bank. Uh, fantastic, and congratulations on that incredible growth. Actually, and your work um, with Stratio, by the way, Stratio is a major company. They also have now another presentation in the main auditorium, uh, and you were uh, having dinner with uh, Oscar uh, Mendez yeah, yesterday night. So that is uh, incredible. But there are other companies equally visionary working on all these uh, artificial intelligence applications. And I was talking uh, to Paolo, and also I am a fan of natural language processing. And Easy Vista is one of the business leaders in this area and others. So, so tell us what are you doing for the business world in Easy Vista? Yeah, um, b before we was talking about, about, uh, about the, the subject of this, this uh, session, and um, in fact, there are one thing that it's important, or to think that it's important to, to, to align here. The AI at this moment um, seems that it's the, 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 the market that is pushing 
but uh, it's not correct in my opinion. My opinion, it's a social demanding. A at this moment, we don't have in the market uh, the sufficient resources for the demanding we have to or, or for, for what we are providing at this moment. We don't have enough resources to do the activities that need to be done. So, um, if I remember 20 years ago, we w I was working in a telco company and we was implementing models uh, in order to um, speed the activities and speed the activities means reduce the human interactions, reduce the, 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 the human interactions. And uh, in that moment, it wa we was starting thinking that this can be uh, a crazy thing. And today, what we are looking is that um, solutions we are providing, and uh, talking about EasyVista or talking about other companies, uh, in the um, natural language process is one part of AI. So yeah, with the chatbots, we are providing to the market. This is fundamental. So uh, I would say that at this moment, 80% of the first interactions uh, with the support centers or customer service today it's made by bots, so uh, there is no more persons behind of the first interaction, um, and uh, we have uh, we have done it. But we've, before that, we have uh, uh, experimented a lot of uh, things using AI. Um, the the um, we are working in the service management, so. A service management means that uh, there, there is a workflow, there is a processes, and uh, today, if I may, uh, all the consultants should be prepared to design the processes, and the processes should be automated as much as possible. And sim it's not because of economy, and uh, Ricardo can talk about it, <laughs> It's, it's really because of the social impact on the, um, on the resources. We don't have resources to do everything what the market is demanded to us. So we really need to automate. So RPA is another, uh, is another point. So um, we need to, to process automatic uh, actions. And uh, uh, between these uh, sectors, there is a lot of potential to grow. Uh, I am uh, enthusiastic. I, um, I know that recently there was companies firing people because the automation is growing. And of course, there is issues on the social um, uh, point. But I have no doubts that uh, the, the people need to co reconvert, uh, reskilling, and we need in the market these persons that have uh, this knowledge. Uh, well, fantastic. Uh, natural language processing is one of the areas I like a lot, also because I'm looking at the subtitles. So this is a uh, translation and transcription, and the software still has some problems understanding uh, English with Mexican accent, English with Venezuelan accents, English with Portuguese accent, and translating also from, from Spanish to English. But the software is intelligent enough that it recognizes that you are speaking in, in Spanish, so it transcribes into English. Uh, anyway, this is one of the applications. And today, after lunch, at 3.30, we are going to have the director of the Millennium Project also in the main auditorium. He's going to talk about business applications of artificial intelligence at 3.30 in the... Uh, main auditorium, and um, the Millennium Project just published this book about uh, how work and technology are going to be in the year 
2050. This is an incredible piece of work. I contributed in this and how the world will change radically in the next few years, radically. We are talking about today, 2023, and, and the, the theme of this uh, Congress is about uh, uh, now is next or next is now and how the world will be in 2030. Imagine in 2050. So let's go to some of the applications of artificial intelligence for business. And you, Ricardo, you are an expert on blockchain. You also follow virtual reality. You follow many of these technologies, all AI related. So tell us some of the things that you see coming soon and their applications in business. <clears throat> Bueno, efectivamente la economía es un gran beneficiado de la aplicación de la tecnología. La economía siempre va a utilizar la tecnología para conseguir eficiencia, óptimos. Ahora estabais comentando cómo aplicáis uh, inteligencia artificial en varios ámbitos. En vuestro campo, en la aplicación, vamos a pensar del back office, más de los procesos. Uh, tú has estado hablando cómo los uh, call centers, los procesamientos en lenguaje natural va cambiando, cómo los bots van cambiando esto y al final llegamos a la cuestión de cómo afecta a la sociedad y cómo afecta al empleo. ¿no? Permíteme simplemente comentar que, uh, en mi opinión, uh, los próximos años uh, se van a abrir muchas oportunidades profesionales de aquellas personas que sepan trabajar o copilotar, como nos va a hacer uh, Microsoft, con inteligencia artificial, pero siento decir y pensar que también va a ser un momento cruel de transición donde aquellas personas que no puedan adaptarse, pues se verán desplazadas del mercado. Uh, más tecnología no significa desaparición de empleos, sino creación de otros muchos, como ocurrió con, con la industria en el siglo XIX, en el siglo XX, o incluso ahora utilizamos todos hojas de cálculo, antes no lo había. Eso no quiere decir que haya menos personas haciendo auditoría, finanzas, contabilidad con hojas de cálculo, sino que se ha duplicado. Eh, Hablabais hace un momento, tenemos un problema importante, en la mayoría de los países desarrollados es de envejecimiento de la población y de número de personas en, con capacidad de trabajar. Simplemente en España, de aquí a 2030, va a haber medio millón menos de personas en el mercado laboral. Ese envejecimiento da la sensación de que la tecnología siempre llega en el momento oportuno para salvar a la humanidad en algún problema. Um, en este sentido... La pregunta que me hacías originalmente, un poco a nivel de blockchain, a nivel de todo. Yo creo que estamos en un momento de convergencia de tecnologías. Eh, también estamos muy con el hype, ¿no? Hace un año estaríamos hablando de metaverso permanentemente y de entornos inmersivos. Ahora estamos con este gran shock de inteligencia artificial que ha superado las máximas expectativas de, de adopción o de prueba. De en cuatro meses eh, ha sido mil millones de personas, cien millones de personas, perdón, las que han utilizado. Eh, iremos descubriendo nuevas capas. Es difícil pensar que va a venir después, pero la computación cuántica, como sabéis muy bien, está en unos años y habrá cambios diferentes. Uh, la tecnología, en cualquier caso, es la herramienta de optimización. Es la cuestión de la ventaja competitiva. Hoy mismo se estaba votando en el Parlamento Europeo la introducción de inteligencia artificial y su regulación. Creo que en Europa vamos a ser muy garantistas en cuanto a su aplicación, pero no debemos olvidar que lo que hay detrás es una competencia internacional, es una guerra, vamos a decir, geotecnológica, en la que habrá países que irán más rápido porque estarán menos regulados y, de hecho, y como veremos con la computación cuántica, la tecnología permitirá la supremacía de unas naciones frente a otras. Esto va a suponer un cambio. Y por cerrar la intervención, un aspecto muy importante que, que está teniendo la tecnología, la inteligencia artificial, y creo que hay que decirlo, y como académico lo digo objetivamente, es el impacto que va a tener sobre todo lo que se llaman las clases medias en las profesiones. Eh, antes la tecnología suplía o complementaba los puestos de trabajo en el ámbito productivo, en la agricultura, en la industria, ahora está llegando al mundo pues, de las profesiones liberales y ahí se asientan las clases medias. De hecho, la tecnología, de algún modo u otro, combinado con otras cosas que están ocurriendo, eh, va a polarizar aún más la sociedad, va a reducir las clases medias, eso tendrá incluso un impacto en los desarrollos eh, democráticos de los países y creo que van a venir fenómenos sociales importantes en los próximos años que nos van a asombrar en algún momento. Eh, el reto yo creo que va a ser cómo convivir con esto y para una mejor convivencia y sana y un desarrollo saludable de todo ello será fundamental la educación, la formación, la permeabilidad también de la sociedad para adoptar 
para aplicarlo y para velar por la seguridad de estas tecnologías en todo momento. Uh, you touch a very important point, which is the aging of societies. We are all aging, and actually yesterday I gave a talk about this. I actually talked about my book, La Muerte de la Muerte, and you, you can look at my tie. My tie is my book also. I highly recommend this book, uh, The Death of Death, because um, uh, this is what is happening in the future. Thanks to artificial intelligence and biotechnology, we are going to stop aging and rejuvenate people. So this is one of the important technologies, uh, in case you missed my session yesterday. But let's continue with the technologies that you see, Edgardo. Which technologies do you see coming? Uh, maybe for the banking uh, sector, but in general, that will affect society. Yes, what is, what is happening today and what we are doing uh, with the Stratio is putting together all the data from customers. That means that we can potentially and that is going to happen really soon, change the way we are interacting with customers in any point of interaction, no? in any channel. Uh, so having, having that capacity with that knowledge to take decisions at the moment or the point of interaction is really, really important. So for example, the customer can be doing a payment in, a, in the mobile app and at the same moment, we are running different processes to grant a credit card or a personal loan uh, or a mortgage to that, to that customer. So that is, that is evolving, I think, in the future and really soon. The only reason why a customer will go to a branch will be to do a cash transaction. No? That in Mexico is still, uh, we have a lot of cash in the economy and the informal economy is, is huge still. Uh, and also for advice to have some advice from a banker, no? So to give you an idea, 10 years ago, more than 50% of the transactions were done in branches. At this moment, it's only 23%, no? And transactions in branches are growing only 3% year over year. But digital channels are growing more than 30%. So that means that percentage will, will continue increasing. Today, 77% of all the transactions in Banco del Bajío are done in not non-assisted channels. That means digital channels and ATMs, no? without any person from the bank interacting with that customer, 77%. And that number was 70% only a year ago. No? So the way we are interacting with customers will be mainly through a digital channel in the, in the future, very in, 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 in just a few years. And uh, let's close with you, Paolo. What do you see coming in terms of uh, technologies AI-related and beyond? Yeah, um, if, if I may, and complimenting uh, Ricardo uh, said, uh, one very old uh, theory the theory of Darwin, it's being, it's being very, very important at this moment. Never disappear, but, uh, but uh, uh, it's being uh, very actual. So we will need to reinvent ourselves um, in, this, in this moment. And uh, the society, uh, yeah, it, it will be art, but uh, I, I, I believe in it. So in, in terms of technology, yeah. Uh, with this, with this uh, uh, data we are processing at this moment, thousands of, and thousands and millions and millions of interactions per second, yeah, uh, the, um, the quantum um, uh, processing, it will be uh, very important in the near future. And uh, the technology uh, is there, so at this moment it's a question to, to the, uh, again, to democratize it and um, in terms of intelligence artificial uh, I, I remember I, I never remember in the prime time of TV assist to earn a, a program of IT and at this moment there is a lot of uh, prime TV um, uh, programs uh, talking about AI so in fact we will have in the next five years 
a lot of implementation in AI and uh, the consequence of that, it will be um, that uh, the, the, the processing, it will increase and uh, if we think that we are living very fast, in five years, we will be much more faster than what, where we are today, so. Yeah, I just want to close to give a real example of this. 50 years ago, we used this. All of us used this, this are an IBM punch card. This is 1K. You can see 100 by 10, 1K. In Spanish, we say 1K. 40 years ago, the first flop it is. This was eight inches big and it was also 1K. I say one in Spanish, 1K plus 1K makes 1K. 1K 40 years ago. 30 years ago, we had floppy disk of 512 kakas. Then 20 years ago, this floppy disk of 1.4 mega. And today I have a pen drive of one terabyte. In 40 years, we have gone from kaka to terabytes. And this keeps on moving exponentially, exponentially, exponentially. So I hope to see you at 3.30 p.m. to talk about business applications in the main auditorium. And I want to finish with an applause to our fantastic panel.